thinking about what to say in the GE conversation. Just checking if my audio is okay. Okay, thank you. Salamat. So, good morning, everyone. A happy Monday to all of us. So, on behalf of uh, VP for Academic Affairs, uh, Dr. Cynthia Bautista, uh, I am Evangeline Amor, 
member of the technical working group of the GE implementation, formally opening the UP System GE Conference 2021. So just a brief, uh, just a brief recall. Now the last uh, System GE Conference was held in 2017. Uh, that was in Mount Malarayat uh, Resort in Batangas. And that was when different groups worked on the modules for the, for the 11 GE courses. And then after 2017, there was a GE teaching conference in 2018, uh, July. And uh, there was also a breakout room there, uh, breakout sessions during that, uh, during that uh, conference. So after, uh, after two years, so because we were supposed to hold GE conferences, system GE conferences every year, uh, here we are uh, in our 2021 uh, GE conference. So this uh, conference aims to reflect, rearticulate, and reinvigorate. So there will be two parts of the conference. So we will have five days of GE conversations. Uh, today, we, we will have three conversations. Uh, and then the second part will be the plenary uh, conversations, which will have discussion on the GE philosophy, the importance of GE, and its intersectionality and interdisciplinarity. Uh, part of the plenary conversation will also be the presentation of the technical working group uh, working on the GE evaluation, presenting the evaluation of the GE framework. So at this point, I'd like to recognize and thank the technical working group of the GE implementation made, made up of uh, Professor Leia. Abaya, Abayao of uh, UP Baguio, uh, Sir Shane Carion of UP Cebu, Ma'am Nak Gabriel of uh, UP Diliman, um, Sir Mo Yanko of UPLB, uh, Ma'am Maricon Carillo of UP Manila, and Ma'am Nelfa Glova of UP Mindanao, Ma'am Nera, uh, Nera Catalbas of UP Visayas, Sir Bagi Bagarinao, of um, UPOU, and uh, we also have as members at large, uh, Ma'am Pat, Ma Pat Arinto and Ma'am Alisa Alampay. So welcome, good morning. I turn over now the screen to our moderator, Sir Pierce Dosena. Hello, magandang umaga. Thank you, Ma'am Vanji. I hope my audio is okay. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so welcome to the first day of uh, our GE uh, conversations. Uh, and thank you, Ma'am Banji, for opening uh, our uh, conference this year. So I am Pierce Dusena. I'm from the Division of Social Sciences, UP Visayas Tacloban College, and I will be your moderator for, uh, for this morning. Okay. And uh, na-mention na po ni Ma'am Banji yung objectives ng ating GE conference, so hindi ko na po uh, ulitin. And I just want to thank everyone who is here in the Zoom meeting room so far. Uh, we're at around 70 and counting. Uh, I think more people are coming in uh, a little later. So I hope you've had a good breakfast or you're having coffee right now. I know it's quite early for probably a lot of us. So please enjoy your coffee while we're listening to the conversation or uh, participating in this, uh, in this conversation. So uh, I am joining this conversation uh, both as an as kind of as an outsider and as an insider uh, to the arts one, okay, or the critical perspectives in the arts. And why do I say I'm an outsider to the group? Uh, it's really because I don't teach arts one. Okay, so full disclosure po tayo. Uh, and if you're wondering what I'm doing here in this group uh, in Arts One, uh, for, uh, for a while I was also asking that question, to be honest. Or sabi nga ng mga ko, same or same with a D and D at the end. But seriously, uh, I am excited to be here because I, you know, I want to broaden my intellectual and cultural horizons, even if I'm not from Arts One. And by the way, that is one of the objectives of, the, of our GE program. Hindi po ba? Nagbasa po ako ng GE framework. 
Okay, and I'm really excited what our panelists have to say in a little while. Uh, I also said I'm an insider in the sense that I've actually been teaching GE in the, in the old GE program before it was revised. Uh, so I've been teaching uh, several GE courses and although I haven't had a chance to handle uh, GE in the new, in the revised, newly revised GE program since 2018, I'm hoping that by participating in this series of conversations, uh, what I will learn from, you know, from this uh, conference will inform my own teaching of GE in the near future. So uh, having said that, um, like I said, I, I hope we will just have a live and fun, pero malaman na conversation. And uh, let's all enjoy this morning's session on, uh, on Arts One. So what are we going to do for the next hour or so? Uh, the first part of our session uh, will be, we will be showing pre-recorded uh, video presentations of our four panelists from different CUs of the UP system. I would introduce them more formally in a little while. And then after uh, we've shown all the four presentations, we uh, will open the floor to your questions and then we will keep the conversation going by asking our panelists to answer those, uh, those questions, okay? Uh, so without uh, further ado, uh, let me uh, introduce uh, our panelists. Okay, so I will introduce each of them before their, their video presentation is played. Let me just pull up my file. Okay, so our first panelist is Assistant Professor Mars Edwinson Briones from the Division of Humanities in UP Visayas Tacloban College. He currently serves as faculty in charge of UP Tacloban's Office of Continuing Education. He obtained his MA in Art Studies, major in Art History from UP Diliman in July 2020. And he has been teaching Arts One since the first semester of academic year 2018-2019. Colleagues in the UP faculty, let us listen and let us watch uh, the video presentation of Professor Briones. Thinking about what to say in the GE conversations made me cast my mind back, way back, to the first time I actually heard the term general education. It was when I was in first year in college in my COM1 class where we had to write a paragraph about the revitalized general education program. My topic sentence? GE is unnecessary. My instructor was right in the comments she wrote. My paragraph was brief. And so was my experience in GE at the time. Now 11 years since I wrote that cringe-worthy paragraph, I find myself overwhelmed by the many ways that GE enriches one's life in the university and beyond. Let me just touch on a few of them, particularly from my experience of teaching Arts One and in the context of remote learning and the pandemic. One of the challenges I've had with Arts One is, perhaps as in most GE courses, its broad scope. Although the syllabus does say that here, the arts is broadly conceived, there seems to be a privileging of the visual arts in the teaching of Arts One. And this, I think, is partly because of the availability of learning resources and the impression that digging deep in one specific matter is better than merely touching upon the surfaces of so many. That is why when it comes to the topic of the language of art, there might be a tendency to focus on painting, sculpture, and architecture. Nevertheless, one could say that the other parts of the course do address important issues pertinent to the arts, broadly conceived. But how they do address these issues in the ways that various themes overlap, recur, or interweave must be pointed out and presented. Teaching is a curatorial endeavor, and I have come to realize this even more since the pandemic forced us to teach and learn remotely. Integrating learning topics and tasks, tracing the threads that run through the course, and striving for coherence are all pre-pandemic regimens. 
But when the unique conditions of remote learning urged us to reconsider students' workload, I have become extra conscious about what I make my students read and do, especially avoiding redundancy in activities and learning outcomes. For the midterm exam, this is what I tried to do. Project Remake required students to choose from a selection of paintings with accompanying essays that contextualize these works. They then had to remake the painting through photography, which may communicate a message resonant with or contrary to the painting's interpretation or presumed message. Coming after topics on the art experience and the specificities of art, the project allows students to reinforce their skills in formal analysis and engage in an actual creative process. Coming before topics on the social, political, and economic forces that shape art, the project prepares students to engage with critical theories and the complexities of interpretation. By reinterpreting the painting's message, they may reflect upon whether this message is at odds with our own context, if it echoes a contemporary issue that they want to re-articulate, if the work can be engaged to think of persistent forms of oppression, predicaments posed by the pandemic that hit us close to home, and the unspeakable effects of systemic problems that we cannot and should not be made to come to terms with. In these instances, art is understood and experienced not as an escape from reality, but a grappling, a confrontation with it. Critical perspectives in the arts become particularly important in the context of an information society in which texts, images, and art practices are shared freely and in multitudes every day and everywhere. In this way, to grasp the world as a set of texts, an active ecology of creative expressions, and to be doubly aware of the ways we approach, relate with, and possibly reproduce them. A lifelong skill of sensing and making sense of the world. The ecology of art, if you will, which involves the processes of production, circulation, and reception, may be said to roughly simulate other forms of relation in the natural and social world. But perhaps one oddity about art is that, as we remember from critical theory, it often seems regarded as divorced from the material and political conditions of society, a pretty part of the atmosphere, a pure realm of creative agency, impermeable, a world unto itself, or one that reflects reality crystal clearly. And yet these are exactly what critical perspectives in the arts demystify. Arts one fleshes out the ways art as a dynamic process of meaning-making also becomes a site for the communication, contestation, and negotiation of ideas and values. The interrogation which critical perspectives empower students to engage in emphasizes that, although art may perpetuate problematic ideas and practices, it could expose and append them. As a GE course, Arts One hones this attitude of curiosity and criticality. A mind that answers questions, yes, but more crucially, a mind that questions answers. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Morris, for that wonderful uh, opening video presentation. And uh, I really love the last line, a mind that answers questions, but more crucially, a mind that questions answers. So, di ko ba ang taking notes here? Uh, ang ganang pang Facebook status, di ko ba? Hashtag GE Conversations. Hashtag Arts One. Okay, so, uh, we still have uh, three more of these you know, reflections and sharings through our pre-recorded uh, videos. And uh, this time, let me introduce uh, our next uh, panelist. Associate Professor Shane Carrion. Dr. Shane Carrion is an Associate Professor at the College of Communication, Art, and Design in UP Cebu, where he also concurrently serves as Gender and Development Coordinator and GE Coordina Coordinator. He has been with UP Cebu since 2007 and has taught courses in the old GE program. He was on study leave as a Fulbright Scholar during the revision of the GE program. 
After finishing his PhD, he returned to active university service in time for academic year 2019-2020. So far, he has taught two semesters of arts one. Dr. Carion's specialization is creative writing, specifically poetry, and his research interests include phenomenology, transnationalism, sound studies, post-colonialism, decoloniality, gender, and popular culture. Let's listen to the presentation of Dr. Shane Carion. To me, Arts One makes a very good GE course in the way it provides a holistic appreciation of the arts beyond the personal subjective sense, like students would no longer just say, it's just art, uh, the artist's expression of his or her feelings. Arts One provides tools, enough tools for students who might not be generally inclined to art. To understand arts, um, often undervalued power and truly appreciate the craftsmanship involved in creating art. To think of art as truly serious and critical with serious and critical impact culturally, socially, ideologically. Um, arts One allows students to experience how creative expression can and is not only an articulation of critical thinking, but also by itself, a critical and transformative action. Um, I haven't had the opportunity to teach Arts One pre-pandemic, so there isn't really much um, of a reference, at least by way of first-hand experience for me, how the modules would be received by students, um, how the modules would look like when they're delivered close to the initially imagined setting, which was perceived to be um, residential teaching or in-person learning. So I am still learning how, in a way, to already modify these modules with the limitations imposed by the sudden remote learning environment. And also, on top of the many other considerations to take into account, from modes of delivery to access to technology and devices, internet connectivities to uh, the more important considerations of health, um, physical, emotional, mental, uh, especially for students. And not only for students, but also for myself who propels the coursework. Um, I'm even feeling this second semester is already taking its toll on the students. Um, and that there's a need to weigh and find balance between compassion and minimum expectations of clearly demonstrated excellence. But at the same time, being equitable too. So those considerations are very important, especially because Arts One is a G course, is meant to encourage and uh, encourage creative, constructive action, transformative action as a Filipino with a sense of shared community and uh, shared humanity, bridging differences or, or cutting through differences. From where I'm coming from, there are always three things I wanted to bring to the table in terms of strategies, not excluding Arts One. Um, collaborations, expansive expressions, and going back to one's roots. Pre-pandemic, I was teaching another coursework that's only even slightly related to art, and students would collaborate and wonderfully express their understandings of concepts and their thinkings of ideas creatively. We'd put up an exhibit at the art gallery and say we'd have team performance art, or installations. So when I learned that I was going to teach arts one, I was really excited. Um, and then all the limitations had to happen. Um, students still did collaborations this time through videos, which is a good thing, though not everybody can be expected to have access to it. 
I had one student who, as his topic response, created a soundscape of what it means being in a lockdown and not able to go outside. Some students did sculptures and collage, which is a good way to have catharsis from all the frustrations, but at the same time, connect this, these expressions with the topics that we have. Um, the pandemic in itself is still, is still yet to find its way as a topic discussion, mostly because I'm still pretty much trying to hold down the set of prepared topics to make, you know, like more elaborate, more clear connections in terms of the topics. Um, but I definitely made room for it in terms of discussions and students' expressions of understanding. Um, for their capsule project, for example, I set expectations of, to demonstrate critical knowledge of an element of art rendered in a Filipino artwork while clearly reflecting on the artwork's entanglements in the social cultural dimensions as well as political and creative industries. So a lot of students would sometimes think about art in relation to expressions that are made by artists in times of the pandemic. Overall, I think there really is such a thing as a G experience when students come through the coursework with a richer sense of interconnections, sensing and making art as a complex expression of beings and being in the world. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Shane Carrion. Uh, again, art as a complex expression of beings and being in the world. Diba? Ang dami ko na pong pang Facebook posts later. But I really love all of these reflections which show you know, where you're coming from, uh, not only in terms of your CU, but in terms of you know, uh, our panelists' experience of teaching arts one, whether they are you know, relatively newbies uh, as arts one faculty and how they manage to you know, transition into the remote uh, teaching and learning environment. And like I said, we will have more of these reflections and conversations uh, after all uh, the presentations. For now, let's move on to our third uh, presentation. Our third panelist is Associate Professor Diego Moranan. Dr. Diego Moranan is an Associate Professor at the Faculty of Information and uh, Communication Studies in the UP Open University, where he is also the program chair for the Bachelor of Arts in Multimedia Studies program. He has been teaching Arts One since January 2019. Let us listen to the presentation of Dr. Diego Marana. Hello, I'm Diego Maranan, and I am the Arts One course manager for the UP Open University, where I am an associate professor at the Faculty of Information and Communication Studies. And I first taught Arts One two years ago. Back then, I had 286 students. Uh, last year, there were 230 students enrolled in Arts One. And this term, we are actually offering Arts One again, and we have 281 students. And so the question for us, um, has always been how do we teach Arts One online and um, at scale. And so I wanted to spend the next few minutes uh, talking about some of the changes that were implemented during the second time that we offered the course based on our experience from the first time uh, offering the course. Um, obviously, one of the big uh, challenges is how do you um, provide consistent and timely feedback to over 250 students at any given time? Uh, how do we support offshore and working students, uh, something that we often have at UPOU in our course, in our um, programs, um, which means uh, teaching asynchronously. How do we keep learners' interest uh, in the course um, throughout the duration of, of the course? And how do we prevent cheating and encourage academic integrity? Um, which might be a bit more challenging if you can't see your students face to face. Um, and supervise uh, their work. 
And so one of the first things that I had done uh, the second time I uh, taught the course was to actually not teach it on my own. And so I recruited another faculty member, uh, assistant professor Banabe Miklat Janssen from EP Diliman, to be the faculty in charge. And I was just a tutor. And often our interactions would center around um, uh, you know, um, coming up with a learning activity. Uh, but now we're asking me, you know, can we do this in Moodle? And me saying, actually, not really, but you know what, what we can do instead is this. Um, and so uh, we divided our labor and expertise um, based on our competence and what we we're good at. Um, and so um, because I was uh, very familiar with the learning, learning management system that we used, which is Moodle, um, I really focused on, um, on configuring the learning management system, on translating the instructional design that we had come up with, um, and supporting um, Banawe as she did a lot of the, um, the assessment um, and, um, and helping really steer uh, the direction of the course uh, in terms of the content. Uh, we had also redesigned the existing Arts One modules um, to make it to make them more interesting and pleasurable to interact with, uh, including creating a web-based adaptation of the original modules, um, where we would also add wayfinding tools such as table of contents and breadcrumb trails, um, and adding supplementary activities um, that uh, would cater to the wide range of, of students um, that we have uh, taking Arts One. So one of the ways that we often uh, get students to engage with the material and to engage with each other is to have discussion fora um, centered around the different modules. Um, so for Arts One, we had and continue to have about 16 discussion fora. Um, but if you think about the number of students that we have and multiply that by the number of discussion fora, that would mean that potentially we'd have thousands of discussion forum posts to mark. Um, and and you know, and that clearly that's that would be impossible um, if especially if you wanted to submit our grades in time. So our strategy um, was to uh, to get you know, in order to get students to to um, participate um, meaningfully um, and fully in each of the sixteen was to uh, tell them that we would randomly select um, three discussion for that we will mark, um, but we wouldn't uh, tell them until the end of the course which ones they would be. Or um, more or less, what we would do is towards the end of the course, maybe when the course is 80% done, we would give them a short list of the six discussion fora we would mark. Um, and by the last week, we would tell them exactly which three we were going to mark, um, just for, um, for, um, yeah, for transparency's sake. We would also highlight notable discussion forum posts um, that students had contributed during the previous week. And we would highlight them during a regular weekly announcement that we would post um, to welcome the week. Um, and this was um, significantly uh, easier than trying to provide feedback to every single one of the 3,000 potentially <laughs> posts um, that, uh, that, we would, uh, um, that would be posted during the course. We would also assign um, coursework collaboratively. So for example, we would randomly pair up students and ask them to discuss a topic for that week. Um, and for the final project, uh, we assigned students in pre-assigned groups and got them to work um, on their final projects. The most, one of the most important things that we did was to incorporate peer and self-assessment um, activities using Moodle's um, unique uh, um, assessment tools and learning, activity, uh, learning tools. Um, so for example, um, in the discussion fora, we would get students to rate each other's posts. Um, Moodle provides something called a workshop activity, um, which allows students to rate themselves and their peers. And you could also, we also ask students to rate groups of individuals. So we'd rate, uh, ask them to rate the final projects of the group. So to recap, these are all the different strategies that we had incorporated the second time uh, that Arts One was taught at TPOU. And the question is, you know, did it work? Um, how do we know whether it was successful? I think one uh, way that, uh, one piece of evidence that we have to think that um, our strategies um, were successful um, was in looking at the great distribution and the great outcomes for the course. So the, um, you can see the first time around, um, which is on the left, in great dis distribution. Um, on the right, you see uh, what the grade, how the grades were distributed the second time around. And you see this really nice, normal curve that you would expect um, in any course. Um, and the other thing to note um, is that if you look at the 
the relative sizes of the number of people who had dropped out or had failed the course, um, it was significant, significantly lower um, in the second time around. Sorry, I, when I say significantly, I don't mean that in a statistical significance kind of way. Um, but you can see that basically um, students seem to have been more engaged throughout the entire process. Um, so uh, to summarize, uh, the way we taught Arts One Online in its scale uh, was to overall structure learning and assessment activities around learner-learner and learner-content interactions um, and de-emphasizing the learner instructor, uh, instructor interactions. Um, taking advantage of randomization um, for designing learning and assessment activities. Um, and finally, using a full-featured LMS-like model, which can do things like randomization, um, which is not something you can do with simpler uh, learning management systems like Google Classroom. Um, so currently we are trying to, for this term, I mean, we're incorporating um, new experiments in our teaching, um, including uh, turning on the Turnitin plagiarism checker um, in discussion fora, and um, looking at whether students can self-organize themselves for the final project groups instead of assigning them uh, beforehand. Uh, I think that's it. Maraming salamat po. Thank you very much, uh, Sir Diego, for that uh, presentation. I've read your uh, comment in the chat box, <laughs> uh, something about your presentation being dry. Not at all, sir. Uh, actually, this is, you know, uh, the, you know, one of the beauties of this uh, conversation is that each uh, faculty member comes into the conversation with a unique con uh, contribution. And, you know, you're from UPOU, and uh, I'd like to think that that is your unique contribution to this uh, conversation. And like many or most of us who have been, you know, kind of grappling in the dark when we shifted to the uh, remote uh, teaching and learning setup, you know, this is actually your your world, your you know, you know, your universe, so to speak. And I'm pretty sure we have more to learn from you later as we open up the floor to the questions of our panelists. So Thank you very much, sir. And I know you mentioned uh, Prof. Banawish is actually here, I think, in the participants. Yes, I swear. Right. So good morning, ma'am. Uh, thank you for being here. Okay. So we'll hear more from Sir Diego in a little while. Uh, let me just uh, introduce our fourth uh, panelist. Last but not the least, we have Mr. Jaime Oscar Salazar. He is an instructor at the Department of Art Studies, or DAS, College of Arts and Letters in UP Diliman. He has been with the DAS since 2017 and has taught Arts One since it was first offered during the first semester academic year 2018-2019. He is a member of the department's Arts One Task Force which was formed to help deal with the challenges of handling the course in remote learning context. He is also a peer support volunteer of the UP Diliman Ugnayan ng Pahinod. Ladies and gentlemen, let's listen to the presentation of Sir J. Salazar. Without much preparation, a decidedly myotic turn of phrase is how a February memorandum from the UP Diliman OVCAA characterizes the manner in which the rapid and wholesale shift to remote teaching and learning has had to take place. We find ourselves little better off as we enter the second year of what is likely to be several more of such a shift, given our government's grossly incompetent and unconscionably negligent handling of the COVID-19 pandemic, exacerbating long festering crises and fomenting new ones economic, political, social, and ecological. The efforts of the Department of Art Studies, or DAS, to come together and confront the challenges of remote teaching and learning began in June 2020, with the establishment of a task force for Arts One. Even as we affirm the value of the official syllabus and modules, we realize the need to more sensitively account for not only the various challenges that had arisen in connection with the pandemic, but also the main directions of the discipline of art studies, and turning points in the intellectual history of the DAS. Our review of our archive of GE course materials served to remind us of enduring interests, tendencies, and commitments, 
and map these out in connection with the intricacies of the more than human world, the social presence of art, the thrill of the aesthetic in our department's intertwined traditions of critique and public service. Although decisions regarding the design and delivery of Arts One were ultimately entrusted to the discernment of the individual course tutor, the foregoing considerations provided us with a common framework of reference and enabled us to arrive at the following promising practices. Broadening our citational universe of texts. Prompted by a proposal that we consider the experiential, the phenomenological, the mystical, and the poetic, and incorporate sources that straddle and elude disciplinary recognition and come in different registers, a number of us sought to stage for our students encounters with art by the roots of poetry, fiction, memoir, journalism, and others, and the hope that these would create situations where they could engage with art in ways that more conventional, analytical, and critical texts might intimidate them from doing. Respecting the richness of everyday life. Our enforced physical separation has moved us to expand the space of the classroom to the immediate surroundings, domestic settings, local ecosystems, and virtual communities of our students, and ask them to examine the forms, materials, and other phenomena that everyday life constitutes and is constituted by. Urging students to attend closely to what they usually overlook or take for granted leads them to become conscious of the sensuous liveliness of the routine and the mundane, perceive social textures and structures of feeling that resist easy capture and locate themselves more deliberately in embodied life. Endeavoring to accommodate our students' different situations and profiles. Access to devices and internet connectivity are merely two components of the remote learning ecosystem and may not even be the most decisive ones. For instance, as recent weeks have sadly emphasized for us, vulnerability to disease and disaster has to be considered. In a bid to accommodate the high degree of differentiation between our students, we have each experimented with various rhythms and formats in designing their workflow. We are also engaged in ongoing discussions on how to respond to our students' needs at this time, however partially, based on the results of a recent department-level check-in survey. Cultivating open communication and collaboration between ourselves. While we each might perhaps have accomplished our ends as teachers independently of one another, our continuing exchanges have facilitated flows of experiences and resources that have enlivened and enriched all of us. Even as we must finally work by ourselves, it is difficult to overstate the value of knowing that we belong to a community from which we can draw support. It is in this vein that we have been pursuing our brown bag sessions on the teaching of Arts One, and laying the groundwork for focus group discussions to explore self-care and mutual care. In a season of great uncertainty, protracting peril, and humbled humanity, we are gathered this morning in order to reflect and converse on the meaning of teaching and learning arts one, and she courses more generally. It might do us all well to remember that the prevailing GE framework informing arts one, approved by the Board of Regents in 2017, addresses itself to the complex issues and challenges in the 21st century, seeks to promote an education that is, among others, non-utilitarian and transformative, and aims to encourage critical and creative thinking and action. These aspirations suggest to me the beginnings of a speculative and contingent itinerary toward provoking what, following Walter Benjamin, could be a real state of emergency one in which we actively renounce the lures of the normal that has led to our current overlapping catastrophes in favor of asserting our agency, broadening our sympathies, and mustering the solidarity and resolve to reimagine and renew our world with and through art. Thus might new forms of life and living together come to arise. Thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you very much, Sir Jay. Uh, and thank you for bringing us back to the, you know, to the GE framework and mentioning the GE philosophy, you know, and for reminding us to reimagine and renew our world with and through art. Thank you, thank you very much to our four panelists. Pwede po kayong mag-react using the reaction button. Uh, or sabi nga ng mga students ko, uh, heart reacts only. <laughs> and dito po sa lower right uh, portion ng ating Zoom uh, meeting app. 
Okay. Uh, again, thank you to our four panelists for sharing your strategies, your tips, and your reflections uh, with regard to teaching arts one. Now we will continue our conversation uh, by opening the floor to uh, the questions of those who are in the Zoom meeting room. So I'd like to invite our panelists, if they can, to turn on their uh, their camera and. Uh, to our participants, uh, you, uh, I think, Steph, if you can, I'm not sure if you can uh, flash again the instructions for those who'd like to uh, send in their questions via Slido. Of course, you can also type them in the in the chat box, uh, and then our secretariat will uh, collate them together with our assistant moderator, who will be asking the questions to our. Uh, to our panelists. Okay. Uh, also, we've already received questions from those who have re registered to this event. So we will be uh, talking about those questions first while we are waiting for uh, questions to uh, questions to come in from Slido or from the from the chat box. Okay. So please feel free to type in. Okay. Yeah, it's already there. Uh, yung link. Uh, he knows na po ni Steph ng GECON Secretariat for everyone. Uh, and at this point, I'd like to introduce our assistant uh, moderator who will be helping me uh, uh, choose the questions. Actually, she will be the one asking the questions to ask our panelists. We have assistant professor Jessa Amarilia from UP Tacloban. Ma'am Jessa, would you like to say a quick hi? Hi, hi, Sir Pierce. Hi to our panelists. Hi, everyone. Good morning. Yes, good morning, Ma'am Jessa. Thank you very much. And by the way, in case you're wondering uh, why you're not seeing uh, Sir J or Sir Jaime Salazar, unfortunately, he cannot open his video for because of connectivity issues, but he is definitely uh, uh, in the Zoom meeting room, so he can still answer your question. So, hindi siya spotlight. Uh, for now, because he's not able to open the video, but he's here. Okay, so yeah, I think we can start, uh, Ma'am Jessa, if uh, you're ready. I believe our panelists are all here, so maybe you can start by asking them the questions coming from those who have registered uh, previously or a few days ago. All right. Uh, thank you, Sir Pierce. Um, these are the questions that we uh, the, the, uh, our participants submitted upon their registration. We organized the questions in, into three categories. The first one is on teaching practices and innovations, especially in a remote learning mode. Um, the second category is opportunities and challenges in teaching arts one. And the third category is the relevance of the GE program in the undergraduate curriculum. So let's start with the questions on teaching practices, innovations, or innovations, especially in a remote learning mode. I believe uh, some of our panelists, um, if I remember correctly, it was Professor uh, Diego Maranen who talked more comprehensively, co comprehensively about uh, the remote learning uh, practices. Um, uh, but here's, uh, but, but perhaps our panelists, um, uh, the other panelists would like to talk more about uh, the, the practices that they did in a remote learning setup. Here's a question. What are the best practices in teaching this course in a remote learning scenario? Uh, related to this question is uh, this other question from Professor Roberto Paulino of the Department of Art Studies of UP Diliman. What practices developed during this period of remote learning do you plan to keep when face-to-face -face classes resume? All right. So again, the questions are, what are the best practices in teaching this course in a remote learning scenario? And what practices developed during this period of remote learning do you plan to keep when face-to-face -face classes resume? Okay. Thank you very much, Ma'am Jessa. Uh, anyone who'd like to, so feel free to, you know, volunteer. Uh, if anyone wants to jump in and you know, kind of take that question, uh, you're very much free to do so. so we're talking like about practices. Yes, Sir Shane. Parang 
beauty pageant. First of all, yeah. <laughs> very good question. <laughs> but kidding aside, um, I think uh, this, this is my first time to use VLE, and I'm so happy about it. Um, and I wanted to maximize and continue using it even after um, you know the pandemic. One of the the features I really love is the asynchronous forum. Um, and then also that when I designed the VLE, all the, stu the students can see from, from, I do it weekly, you know, like a weekly format. So they can see from the first week to the very end of the week. So they can uh, do their readings ahead of the others. But at the same time, we have the forums, uh, forum questions, just to make sure that nobody gets left behind. But if they want to read ahead, then by all means, they can do that. Um, I want to continue doing that. Um, I do feel that if you have like a humongously populated class, like 280, you can't like answer, you know, respond to each one. Um, uh, right now I have only in this particular semester, I have 12 um, arts one students. So I, get to respond to them in the forum. Um, moving forward, one of the things I would also continue is the practice of creating art. And then we'd have like maybe a show and tell, um, not just, you know, not just like because I feel this, but they can talk about the elements, they can talk about the entanglements of, of this art when it is probably presented somewhere, or things like that. So I'd, I'd like to keep on doing that. I thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, uh, Sir Shane. Yeah, and uh, so these are the features of the remote uh, teaching and learning experience that we can probably continue when you know when we shift back to face to face or even blended learning. Uh, Sir Mars, would you like to add more to that? I, I know that Sir Diego is quite busy, you know, uh, already responding to some of these questions in the chat box. So maybe we can. Turn over to Sir Maris for now. Uh, sige, sige. Um, uh, just like uh, Sir Shane mentioned, no, parang I think it's it's necessary to continue remote learning. Uh, like after the pandemic, probably it's gonna be blended learning now. No? So it's gonna be a combination of face-to-face -face interaction and, and remote learning. And uh, the crisis has made us realize um, the advantages of remote learning. No? So that's something which uh, I plan to carry on, which I think I will have to do naman because I'm not sure if that's the step that, that the university is going to take. Um, but aside from that, uh, another thing which I found particularly helpful in, in remote learning and in the preparations is uh, completing the course pack before the semester starts. Um, this made me more conscious and strategic in designing the course as a whole rather than adding to it as the semester goes. Uh, of course, even in the remote learning setup, there may still be minor adjustments as the semester unfolds. But with uh, completing the course pack um, at the beginning of the semester, you are able to understand the course as a whole and see how its uh, constituent parts relate with or, or build upon each other. And I think uh, this helps to avoid afterthoughts or you know topics and activities that are merely added to the course for the sake of you know completing it. Uh, for sure, preparing the, the full course pack at the start um, was very challenging, but at least in my case, uh, it helped to imagine how the course will begin and end, uh, you know, to, to have a more purposive approach in, in delivering the course. Yeah, thank you, Sir Mars. Which reminds me, actually, now that you mentioned about yeah, you know, the preparation of the course pack, you actually sent uh, a video entry to the UP Remote and Teaching Learning Expo. So, the plug So, if you want to learn more about that in course uh, preparation, you can actually check the website of the UP Remote Teaching and Learning Expo for more tips and strategies on you know uh, how not only from the arts run but how our other faculty members. Uh, handle their own courses as we transition to uh, remote teaching and learning. Uh, Sir Jay, would you like to add uh, or to say something or address this question? Yes, Sir Pierce. Uh, good morning yes. to everyone. Um, with regard maybe to the first question about uh, best practices, no? um, I think that 
if uh, there is such a thing uh, as a best practice, we, we have yet to invent it. Uh, and I say that because um, while remote pedagogy is a well-established uh, field no, of practice, uh, I don't think it was necessarily developed to respond to our specific context right now no, uh, amid the pandemic. And so in a way, you know, to, as, as uh, Sir Pierce put it a little earlier, you know, we're, we're, in a sense, we're all still groping no, in, in the dark no, uh, for how to, to reach out to our students in the best way possible. Uh, and you know, how, because how do we know what is best, no? Uh, except retrospectively, you know? um, And we're not yet done <laughs> with this crisis. Uh, with regard to the other question about a uh, practice that will that I will retain no? um, beyond uh, this period, uh, one practice I think will be uh, allowing my students to assess themselves. I had previously uh, already incorporated self-assessment, but only for group work here in self-assessment. No? But uh, for this period, no, I've included the self-assessment component for all the course requirements. And I think this helps to uh, develop uh, a stronger sense of accountability uh, among the students, as well as um, you know, makes them more conscious. You know, what exactly am I trying to get out of the course, what am I learning? And uh, the self-assessment also has space for them to justify the grades that they give themselves. So uh, I do tell them, you know, you, you can't just give yourself high scores and, you know, I will just take that as is, no? but they also have to explain why they think they deserve the scores. So that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Jay. Yeah, maybe uh, tricky yung best no word no, but uh, I remember uh, in sa presentation, Sir Jay he actually talked about promising practices uh, in this time of uh, pandemic, and I actually like that they have a task force in the department to take care of these uh, concerns. Uh, Sir Shane, you're raising your hand. Yeah, I wanted to dovetail about uh, assessment and self-assessment. Um, this is not GE, but it is a strategy that I miss doing in the, in the remote uh, experience, which could have been applied. Um, before the pandemic, my students, and at the very start, like first day, my, my students and I would talk about how they wish to be graded on certain, like for example, we talk about the, the rubrics. So it is possible, like, I might be whole, uh, having two sections of, of the same course, but their topic response will be evaluated differently depending on how students, you know, they will, you, it's amazing. It becomes like students actually stand up and would say, we wish to be graded this way. And then they would vote and they would, so it, it's very dynamic. Um, and so the topic responses is graded according to how they wish to be evaluated. That is something I couldn't do yet, maybe in this uh, remote learning, because I wanted to make, it's not fair for those students who don't have constant access online or those who have none at all. So when I prepared my module, for example, there is all, uh, I translate it to digital, but there, the, the basic is really hard copy. So if you're a student who has no access at all, you will have the, almost the same opportunities. I think of it as like um, allowances and you have, if you can go online, um, you have an enrichment. And then if you can go synchronous, then you have a little more extra, but you have the essential if it is um, hard copy. So I, I couldn't do the self-evaluation or peer evaluation in that sense online. And, and, and this is again, uh, coming from you know our own, uh, you know, distinct realities, you know, that whether, you know, where we are located or where our students are located, uh, for example. Thank you, Sir Shane. Uh, Sir Diego, uh, would, you, would you like to add anything more? I know you've already, you know, talked about this extensively in your presentation, but, you know. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. So um, I wanted to summarize this discussion, very interesting discussion I'm having with 
Dennis and Raginaldo, so Zoom. Um, and the question is really around um, how, you know, the randomization strategy of assigning, of having 16 discussions and then marking only three of them. How is that um, a defensible strategy? Um, and so, so in this discussion, I was reflecting upon how, yeah, and um, so the way I think about it is in terms of recitation. If you had, if you're grading core class recitation, um, the, you know, recitation needs to be graded over a period of time. And if you are one student, one teacher, and you had a class of 280 students, how do you do this? How do you grade this effectively in, in a face-to-face -face setting? Then how do you translate that in a remote um, kind of way? Um, and, um, and so I think the randomization, because uh, you know, if, you, if you had to grade the recitation of every single one of 280 students over the course of 13 weeks with 11, 10 modules in Arts One, um, it's quite daunting. Um, and I think, so there's a few strategies that make it defensible. One is that you progressively disclose. Number two is that you, you are radically open in, the, in your deadlines. So I was saying that for Arts One, pretty much everything is due at the end of the class. Um, uh -oh. um, there's nothing, oh, there's almost nothing that's due at the beginning of the, of the course. Um, Self-assessment, as was just discussed, is incredibly important in peer assessment. And I think basically the more eyes there are on the work of students and the more that students participate um, in, um, in the grading, um, the more likely that the grade that the students are assigned um, would be objectively um, defensible and would withstand um, scrutiny. Um, in fact, one of the things that I haven't done before, but I'm trying in another course, is actually getting students to construct the, um, the syllabus and the marking guide with me. So for example, so in, my, in our final project, um, so Capstone ng BAMS, um, Bachelor of Arts Multimedia Studies Program, I actually asked students, tell me how you would like to be graded. Tell me what weights I should prioritize. That's something I haven't I thought about so Arts One. Um, and maybe we can start doing that. Because that's still along the same in this along the same lines of getting students to reflect on themselves, asking students to para tell me on what grounds you would like me to assess you means na you're asking to think saan ba ako talaga magaling. Um, yeah. Thank you, Sir Diego, for you know uh, explaining more about that, especially about the randomization you know, strategy that we used, which is probably you know something new to to many of us now. Uh, if I can uh, go back to Mam Jessa, is there another question from the from the list that you'd like to ask our participants? I mean, our panelists. All right. Uh, one more question about um, the remote teaching. Um, there's a question here that goes: How do you effectively use the virtual synchronous sessions to maximize learning? Um, really, uh, this question is by. Professor Vicente Horlano from, from UP Diliman, the Population Institute of UP Diliman. Related to the question is this question by Professor Joseph Andrew Carvajal from the College of Arts and Communication of UP Baguio. What are some effective strategies that our colleagues use to sustain student engagement during synchronous classes? So the question is something to do with synchronous sessions. I'm not sure if any one of you here is actually, you know, doing that. So uh, is anyone actually doing primarily synchronous sessions? Sir Jay says, you know, he doesn't do synchronous sessions. Uh... Actually, can I respond? Yes. I don't. Yes, Sir Diego, please. And I actually think now I should do more of that. Um, it's just a matter of how do you establish what the best time is. I think it's I think it's worth it's worthwhile doing a synchronous session. Um, if it, not necessarily to be, because it you know para some I think just because by letting the students know that you're there um, and by being able to you know to um, field questions um, and then recording the entire session, I think it would be useful. And I think doing it maybe even twice or once during the the course. Um, three times, a few times, it would be uh, very productive. That's something to explore. Yeah, Sir Shane? Um, I have uh, pre-scheduled synchronous meetings, that's every other week, uh, but I highlight that is 
only if you wish to, if you're interested, and if you're able. And I structure all my synchronous meetings. I tell them beforehand, I also put it up um, in my VLE. Um, it should be no more than one hour long unless students are pretty much engaged. So it's not, I have, a, I have one class, it's not GE and the students are so like crazy about it. It's about celebrity. So we actually end up one hour and a half and half is like, oh, okay, that's a little too much. But for arts one, um, so I begin with the introduction, uh, like Kumustahan. It's not like an attendance. I used to do this for roll call back in the day, pre-pandemic, but now it's pandemic, it's Kamustahan. Like um, if you were a caller today, or if you were, you know, like scale of one to 10, one is, and 10 is like, so that pretty much, um, or if you are, so that kind of thing, just to give a, like a, how things are. And then after that, um, I also prepared before the synchronous meet a 10 minute video, no more than 10 minutes, because I, I'm always thinking some students only have their cell phones. And I, I'm very conscious about screen exhaustion. So 10 minutes is that, that's it. I would up, um, I have a 10 minute uh, pre-recorded uh, lecture. And later on, I, well, it is scheduled to be shown or accessible in the VLE at a certain time. Um, together with that would be a script. So I will have the video, 10 minute video and the script uploaded in the VLE accessible after an hour or two hours um, from the synchronous meeting uh, schedule. So that's a 10 minute. And then, uh, so we have the roll call-ish, kamustahan, 10 minute video. And then after that, just open the, like, are there things that you wish to talk about or, you know, like, and then if the students, some students actually raise questions. It doesn't have to be like on the spot, um, or spot on talaga sa topics ng unit. Minsan nagkakabit-kabit na yung iba, iba units. Um, sometimes they talk about their work in progress kasi yung mga topic responses namin, ganun. And then if there's no question, no other things to talk about, we close shop for the day. Um, yun. I think that's, I'm not sure if that's the best practice, but that's how I'm, I'm doing it, yeah. Yeah, thank you, Sir Shane. And again, you're considering, that's really because you're considering the conditions of your students and whether they can actually you know, log into these sessions, these synchronous sessions and participate. Uh, Sir Mars, would you like to say something? Um, to be honest, uh, I, I have not done, I have not yet done a, a virtual synchronous session um, because at least last semester when I thought, because this semester I'm not teaching arts one, and that was because I, I felt like not everyone has a laptop or internet ready phone or good internet connection. But I'm not sure at this point if almost everyone already you know, has these resources. Um, in addition, uh, synchronous sessions are also challenging in the sense that uh, you and the students have to mentally and perhaps even emotionally prepare for it. Um, but should I schedule a, a synchronous session, which I am contemplating this semester? Uh, it will definitely not be for lecture or discussion of specific topics, but for exploring broader questions that will help elevate the, the discourse on the specific topics and for taking advantage of, of the situation ha of having people in the virtual room at the same time to bring them into conversation uh, with each other. Yeah, so I, so I see this is, you know, a really doing synchronous versus asynchronous sessions, you know, it's really kind of tricky, you know, given so many considerations, uh, you know, access to the device, to the internet, and uh, so many other, so many other things. And uh, I think at the end of the day, it really, uh, you know, goes back to us knowing our learners uh, as well. Uh, Sir Shane, you wanted to say something else before I move on to the next uh, question? Yeah, I also wanted to add now what what did then add, after kasi like um, all the topics are done. Um I call it sync meet. So we don't have sync meets anymore, but I make myself available 
at least three times a week synchronously. I call it live consultations. Uh, so the way I do it towards the end of the semester, uh, like uh, previous semester, when the students are starting to work on their capstone paper, capstone, pro capstone projects, um, I would, again, pre-schedule. So first thing on Monday, I would like schedule emails to be sent out first thing Monday morning at eight o'clock. And then I will have the Zoom schedules. I have a morning session. Like, and I would, uh, so there's a morning, afternoon, and early evening, just to make sure that, you know, like when they're able, or when they can, when some students can say, I feel like they're not, they can't express so well if it's like written through email. So you mag on. And I tell them that I was, for example, like I have a schedule at three o'clock in the afternoon. And I tell them, I'm going to wait, even if there's no one in the room. And you know what? Uh, I'm going to wait for maybe 15, 20 minutes. I tell them that. Whether I think it's just a comfort, at least I'm imagining, that when the option is there, when they can, when they wish to, they can drop by the office. And you know what? Some students actually drop by. I don't ask them to register. I just stay there for like 15, 20 minutes. And they would ask yeah. about topics and then you know parang walang pressure basta nandiyan it's, lang. Really, it's really just our way of assuring them that hey we're still here and you know uh we're yeah you know, the, the store is open so to speak yeah the yeah, virtual uh, office is open i think that's a really good compromise between you know para having a um, regular secret session and um yeah and anyway, I, i'm going to i'm going to steal that from you shane yeah, I think we have one uh, raised hand from a participant. Uh, Prof. Gerard Eusebio, uh, would like to speak? Hello. Uh, please okay. go ahead. Yes, good, good morning, morning, sir. Is, is my so, audio clear? Yes, yes, sir. Okay, hi, I'm Gerard from UPLB, Department of Humanities, and I'd just like to share about synchronous sessions. Now, I've been doing it weekly i ask the students which day of the week because we follow the the schedule on online or based on what saiz gave us so like for example uh, my arts one class i have an 8 30 to 10 so that's when we meet but only one day per week so i ask them which day they prefer uh, but um in upl you know in the department of humanities i think this is this is what we were encouraged to do um have synchronous sessions at, uh, weekly and then um record all of these sessions and then share the recording later on. And then they're not required, uh, no grading, no graded recitations during that synchronous session. And um, there, you know, so basically that's like uh, the rule or the, like the, the practice that we do. So, uh, what I did this semester, which I did not do last semester and I wish I, I, I knew better, uh, but that's very understandable, was to meet my students on the first week of classes. And actually have uh, recordings of the free sections that I, I met online. And I made it like a really big thing. You know, like I, I was very um, energetic and I kind of showed them my personality because I, I felt like that was very important. You know, like how they say first impressions last. I think that was very important because uh, during the first semester of remote learning, I noticed that um, my students didn't really know me and I didn't really know them. In fact, if I... <laughs> If I look back on last semester, I would only be remembering students who were very active in giving their comments and in um, reaching out to me via email, and you know, especially the ones who had a, a profile picture. And so those would uh, would you know, just letters and just silhouettes. No, hindi ko na sila matandaan, and uh, that was heartbreaking for me as an educator. And so this semester, I, I vowed to like meet them and see them. And uh, what I experienced last semester guided me because the first time that I tried to do a synchronous session and they knew about it, um, almost everyone showed up, like just two students who didn't show up. And this, this time when I, when I held the first meeting ever this semester, uh, in each section, only one or two did not show up. So that, that to me was such a win you know, that, uh, that I heard their voices that I saw their faces. And we now have actually a class picture. At least I have that. And, and we have that towards the end of the semester. And I noticed that they were um, more open to, to communicating with their peers and to me as well. Uh, like um, 
<laughs> I received like more than 10 direct messages within the first two weeks of, of meeting them. And, uh, yeah. you know, it, it is quite taxing. It, it, I made a slide. I, I did like a me- mini vlog to like invite them to that synchronous session just to encourage them to attend and to like really show that, you know, I'm not, uh, I'm not a stranger and I'm really he- I'm here for them. And the class is for them, not for, for me. Yeah. And uh, th- that was very good to, to be established right at the beginning. So they know yeah. na yeah. tayo. I think the tayo like here to just give them stuff to do while they while they struggle in this pandemic and like languish away you know, towards the end of the semester. But uh, right now, no, the, the the attendance has kind of dwindled. But um, many of them like say sorry and explain why they couldn't attend. And I, I always have to reassure them that that, that that's okay. You know. But the recorded synchronous session is is out there for you to access. Um, yeah, if, and yeah. if I may add, no, just for like I guess to add to what was um, talked about about the syllabus. Now, since 2018, I've I've done this practice. Now, I present a draft of my syllabus, and then I I send it to the students first week, and then I ask them um, what they think about it, which parts they they would like to. Uh, change or edit, and then we talk about it in class. So that's like their first assignment. And to like review your syllabus and tell me if there's anything that's not fair, if there's anything that you like to change. And sa experience ko po, ang lagi lang nilang in-edit ay yung grace period from five minutes to like 10 minutes or 15 minutes na hindi sila yung mark na late. Kasi, the, yeah, especially for my 7 a.m. classes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir Gerard, for sharing those, you know, those practices. Yeah. Uh, so for, uh, for all our uh, other participants, please feel free to type in your tips and strategies. Uh, I know we only have very limited time, but, you know, just by reading through your comments, uh, all our other participants can also, you know, learn from your experiences. So before we move on to the next question, maybe Sir Diego would like to, you know, address us, uh, uh, some of those things that have been already that have been raised in the chat box already. Yeah, uh, sir Diego, you want? Yeah, yes, there's, sir? One, there's one uh, particular issue. That it's it's worth highlighting. You know, issue of using other platforms mm-hmm. other than the UP sanctioned ones, um, such as Facebook and Discord. Mm-hmm. Um, and this was an interesting experience, especially at the height of the pandemic. Some students could not access, uh, but only had free data, and so they really relied on YouTube and Facebook. Uh, for communication. Um, um, and this kind of ran against or runs against the current policy natin about, you know, we can only, you know, because of data privacy, um, we can only use per- specific per- um, uh, personal information processors. I don't know how to resolve that. Um, I personally don't use Facebook, but I understand as a teaching tool, but I understand um, teachers who do um, find any utility in it. Um, yung, uh, yeah, that's, I'll leave it at that. Yeah, but this is probably a conversation that you and your other colleagues can continue talking about you know, even outside this particular yeah. session because I, that's that's really that, that's a big thing. Kumbaga. Okay. But thank you for, for addressing that question, Sir Diego. Uh, let's go back to Ma'am Jessa. Are, uh, any more questions from the from the participants? Hi. Um, yes, there are more. There are many questions here, actually. But let's move on to the next set of questions on the relevance of the GE program of Arts One, in particular, in the undergraduate curriculum and in this time of crisis. So there are several questions here about um, the relevance of, of Arts One. Um, uh, what is the place of the arts or Arts One in the time of COVID nineteen pandemic? And I think that I think there's a similar question in the chat box. So so that's the question. Yeah, thank you, Ma'am Jessa. Maybe we can start with Sir Jay. Would you like to address that one? I know you touched on this in your presentation. Um, Sir Pierce. Yes. Uh, before Ma'am Sir Jay. Sir Jay speak, may I um, add this question? Uh, how do you motivate your students to study at a time of uncertainty and mm. suffering? Okay. Yeah. That's a, I mean, that's a hard one. Um, I think we've all touched on this issue, which is um, you have to provide, yeah, to, to take a step back when needed, um, to not feel the pressure. Um, and as a OU, um, we, 
you know we have a we have a really specific practice of 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 being as lean, we've always had this of being as lean as we can with deadlines, uh, for example, um, and um, and and so in, specifically in terms of deadlines. Although I said now everything is due at the end of the course, there's also expected completion dates so that students know, parang um, when to when to um, when they should be completing something, even if they can complete it at least um, Other than that, I think just being there, as um, C. Shane um, has has said. Yeah, thank you, Sir Diego. Uh, Sir Jay, uh, would you like to add uh, more to this question? Teaching arts one, especially in, you know, in this crisis. Well, um, okay. Uh, I should say the second question is immensely difficult. No, uh, I'm not sure that we can really answer. But uh, as regards the, the place of the arts or the place of arts one uh, during the pandemic, no, uh, uh, or in a time of crisis. No? Um, I don't know, I'm also a little bit uncomfortable with this question maybe because it forces us to be a bit defensive. No, I mean, uh, that we are constantly having to justify the arts whereas other fields of practice never have to do that. You know, um, and, I, and I think it's a self-defeating proposition. I think we should start from the premise that it is important. And uh, if our students uh, don't believe that, then of course that's uh, another, I don't know, that's a different uh, challenge. But um, because the, the, it tends to be couched in terms of how will this help me get a better job? No, kung ganun ba ang train of thought, will this help me get employed? I, mean, I, I don't think that's what the arts are for. No, um, if if the arts are for anything, quote unquote, no, if there's any, uh, I don't know, value that we should be asserting with regard to the arts, it's it's learning to love the questions, no, as uh, the poet Rilke would put it, no, learning to love the questions, or as uh, Sir Mars has already put it, no, to develop minds that question answers. Uh, so it's not really about um, having a specific outcome. No? And I want to go back to the GE philosophy you know, that specifically says GE should be non-utilitarian. No? So it's not necessarily oriented towards specific competencies or, or, or skills. No? Um, but uh, if, if nothing else, no, it should help our students to uh, activate their sense of agency to be able to imagine the future. No? And I think that's what's causing a lot of the despair among our students. So they're having such a hard time imagining what the future could be in when we are so uncertain. And we cannot provide that certainty. We cannot know the future. But uh, we can try to teach them to live with contingency. So that's it. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Sir Jay. Yeah. What about you, Sir Mars? Would you like to address that question? Um, I, th I think this question, like uh, uh, Sir Jay mentioned, has to do with uh, the GE framework really developed. I mean, if we're going to be confronted with this question, um, like Sir Jay said, we just have to say that GE is non-utilitarian. Um, I think particularly the, the uh, GE framework Sorry, the framework for the arts one uh, course, the syllabus for it, specifically mentions that um, the arts and the skills to understand and grapple with it are necessary, especially in the context of an information society in which texts, images, and art practices are shared freely and in multitudes every day and everywhere. So, of course, this um, uh, speaks of art in the broad sense, not only in the sense of the fine arts or in the visual arts. You know, parang the idea of how art is a process of meaning making. And uh, with so much more time spent online now, we encounter more of these texts, images, and art practices, or creative pra uh, practices to be more uh, general about it. For example, with, with memes and, and news articles, memes are very, uh, they're very visual. And like, they might seem like they're just things that are funny, but you can study memes in the same way that you look at the painting as formal analysis um, helps us do. So, so 
these kinds of images and texts, they are very loaded. And by studying Arts One, students could be become more sensitive to the process of meaning making, uh, to the production, circulation, and reception of, of these images and texts. And uh, perhaps they can also understand how, just for instance, how memes could be, they are actually already forms of critique. And to become even more aware of how memes operate may help us make use of, of them more tactically. So I guess that's it. I mean, uh, we should think of the arts not as separate from our lives, but as something that is entangled with it and that we participate in actively. But when we think about the arts more generally in, in the sense of creative expressions, uh, so that students do not uh, become mere passive recipients of, of images and texts. Yeah, thank you, Sir Mars. Uh, Sir Shane, did you want to add something more to you know your relevance or place of Arts One, especially in, you know, in this very difficult times? Kasi pandemic ngayon, um, most of the, I noticed most of the students actually like the supplementary text I gave them, like um, Bjork. I give them Bjork and let them think about it. Yung mga, whoa! And then I had one student, initially, kumsay siya, hesitant talaga siya, para sa kanya, like, art is, you know, like, he's not, he always, he says, like, I'm a STEM guy. That's like his thing, I'm a STEM guy. And then later on, the same guy, the same student, actually found about David White, who, who writes about, who, who makes art, you know, graphic, conceptual, so I think that kasi these days, medyo screen talaga, it's, it's worthwhile to take advantage of the things that students can find online, expressions of art. That is more, uh, medyo popular, medyo nas, and hindi siya yung, kasi med, I wanted to break the idea that when you think of art, they always think about paintings and sculptures. So. So there's David White. We also have yung mga soundscapes and lightscapes. Uh, I showed them an animation by Sean Tan, uh, yung The Arrival, which is like really cool. And that's how students like, oh, this is how lines should be like. And you know, the color, we talk about color in the absence of it. Yung Sean Tan's Arrival. And it's accessible online. You just, you know, it's available on YouTube. And, um, but I don't, I just showed them the link. Like, if you want to check this out, you can check this out. And Ayun, it's it's very engaging for them. I wanted to, and a uh, couple more things. I also welcome students thinking about videos, video games, because art. To, I tell them art is nexus. So must yung mga yung mga guys sa mahilig mag video games. Ayun, I ask them why do you think ganyan, You know, like that game character yung setting and then they start thinking about their video games and as a way uh, uh, as a form of art yung expression visuals yung sound so you okay that pretty much hooks them up and then then we start about talking about balik <laughs> balik na naman sa painting <laughs> so yun yung <laughs> but but they're already there so ayun i i, I so expanding the definition of art to include things like video games and you know i, I think that's important um and in fact but, uh, um arts one is probably the most relevant course to the pandemic to people's lives that i'm teaching this this term um yeah yeah so so many opportunities so to speak but before we go to the opportunities especially opportunities and challenges i think sir jay wanted to add something more sir jay Yes, hello. Uh, maybe to give a more specific example, no? because uh, one of the practices that we are trying to do at DAS is to um, account for everyday life no? in our discussions of art. And I think that's an, that's an important uh, move no? uh, to, to ensure that our students appreciate the relevance of the art. So uh, we've already mentioned video games um, and other forms. So, um, my my on I have an ongoing module right now on architecture and um, one of the texts no, is is a uh, is an article uh, talking about how our different architects respond um, are are responding to the pandemic. So uh, and then we talk about it also in in terms of uh, general urban development, um, the climate crisis. You know it. Uh, and so on and so forth. And so uh, there, I think, uh, uh, since we're going to talk about opportunities, there are plenty of opportunities not to, 
highlight no, where uh, art plays a role. Uh, and that's just a matter of uh, being able to find what uh, captures uh, the interest of our students. So yes, many of them play video games or, or I don't know, uh, uh, play uh, or listen to certain types of music and you know accounting for their interests also helps a lot so that's thank you yeah thank you sir uh sir jay uh for you know talking about this in i mean adding to that you know question again um, Mam jessa you wanted to uh select some more questions or i know my, maybe we're running Quite, yeah, <laughs> we're quite out of time. Of time. Yeah, but maybe just one more question before we kind of wrap things up. All right. Uh, um, perhaps, yeah. Uh, perhaps our panelists can talk more about the opportunities and challenges in teaching arts. One, here are questions here. Um, which modules, topics do the students find most interesting? What are the essentials that we cannot compromise or skip? Or how can arts one be taught from a literary perspective? And here's one more question that uh, says, what is the most problematic situation that you have encountered in teaching GE during the pandemic and how did you solve it? So that's it, sir, Piers. Okay, so those were you know, several questions, but feel mm -hmm. free to choose you know, any one that you'd like, to, uh, you'd like to address. So now we're talking more about you know, the challenges, difficulties, or even opportunities of teaching arts one. Um, opportunities. Um, uh, I mean, especially if we start incorporating um, the pandemic as a theme in our course, um, I think there's real opportunity in uh, what students do for arts one can have an impact um, in the real world. And although but we've been talking about, you know, you know, arts isn't always an utilitarian, actually, you know, in module nine and module eight, or, you know, the art, you know, the market um, around art, we actually talk about art being a utilitarian thing, that it is the product of social forces, that it has economic value. So what if in the process of, of, of getting students to reflect on how can the arts help um, in this time of crisis, we can actually create um, solutions that will um, have an effect on a broader scale. So for example, Sibanao and I this term and last term, um, our final project revolved first, last, last term was, what might the future of the arts look like post pandemic? And then we asked them to do, okay, so do a, parang, a scenario analysis. So what might the world look like? And therefore what kinds of new genres might emerge? And so they, they can become, I know, potentially a part of the people ushering in new art forms. Um, and then the other thing, now it's quite utilitarian, I was like, okay, post pandemic, how can the arts help with economic recovery, but not just in the sense that, you know, you can use it to sell more products. So we give them a little bit of that cr critique um, and we, we outline but in different ways. And yeah, so that's, I think one opportunity. Thank you, Sir Diego. Uh, anyone else, Sir Shane? Uh, I think one of the, topics now students find very interesting is when art becomes entangled with the relations of power and identity. Um, I give them a, an example of a typewriter. So one time I went to MoMA, I forget, I think it was MoMA. No, uh, something like that. Uh, my typewriter, I put in the corner. Then I showed it I showed it to students. And then, you know, like, um, when I tell them that this one is in an, in an art gallery, do you think this is art? How it becomes art, the processes of validation and the yung mga power relations, yung kasama na dun yung, yung um, cons, uh, art as an object of consumption, yung mga ganun. And then I always tell them it's, it's good to ask questions and, the, and, and wonder. And wonderings don't need to have answers right then and there because the answers might find its way to you after some time to ask questions and not be afraid to ask questions you know so minsan i show them a piece of you know like that typewriter and I, I give them a background this typewriter is made by this person ito yung artist statement niya so when students create art for topic responses for example requirement ko na may 150 word 
uh, artist or creator statement. So doon, kasi yung mga, some students kasi may photograph na parang shadowy. And then hahanapan yung connection dun sa artist statement. So when I give the background of this art, hindi lang siya all the time politics na social and pakikibang. And it's part of it, but you know, like, nasa museum siya. Sino gumawa? Bakit ginawa? Sino yung parang audience? Kasi nga, pag nasa museum siya, prohibitive din siya. Hindi naman free yung museum. Yung mga ganun. Uh, so, and then I ask, what kind of questions can be surfaced? What kind of questions can be asked? What forms of thinking and understanding? So, minsan, or kadalasan, open-ended siya. The, quest I, the questions I also post in the forum, I tell them the forum, the weekly forum. Uh, we, I have our conversations week. So, in that week, we have like a weekly forum and we have the sync meet. I tell them, you don't have to answer the forum questions. The forum questions are there to help you think things, to help you wonder. And kasi I, I believe na sa pagtuturo ng arts, one hindi siya agad-agad. Like, they will get there at their own time. Ngayon. So. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Shane. Uh, Sir Mars? Um, baka din na lang sa, ano, sa question of uh, the most problematic situation that I have encountered in teaching GE this, uh, in the time of a pandemic. Um, to be specific ab about GE, because this is uh, what we are dealing with, I think one particular feature of what might be called the GE experience has to do with how interdisciplinarity is highlighted, not only in the design of the course content and activities, but also in the learning environment. So an example of this is having in one section students from different academic disciplines. The idea is so that uh, topics in Arts One could be unpacked from multiple perspectives say of students taking up management, social sciences, or humanities uh, programs. So the exchange of ideas that happens in, in the classroom should demonstrate and foreground this interdisciplinarity of, of the course and how this helps in thinking of and dealing with, um, as the GE framework says, um, complex problems confronting individuals and, and communities on national and, and global scales. So this is especially challenging in remote learning Actually, this, this was also challenging before the pandemic uh, because there were logistical difficulties in scheduling and sectioning that most of the time we would end up with block sections, a section of all psychology or all political science students. But I think uh, facilitating uh, this interdiscipl these interdisciplinary conversations, or in fact, conversations in general um, among students has been even more challenging because besides that there is still blocking, uh, block sectioning um, you also you will also have to bring into one conversation students who share their inputs from several platforms like the VLE, particularly its forum feature or email, messenger, text message, etc. So this is of course because, uh, at least in my experience, although there is strong encouragement, I'm not sure if it's already a requirement, to, to use the VLE, for some students it is more convenient or possible to communicate through alternative platforms. So for faculty members, the challenge has become not only on the level of bringing students' ideas to bear upon each other, but also on a practical, logistical level. And I'm not sure how, like what, I mean, how to solve that. It's still an ongoing uh, problem, but yeah, we're still yeah. continuing to deal with that. Yeah, that should be an ongoing conversation, yeah. Sir Mars, I think. Yeah, uh, Sir, Sir Jay, would you like to add more to that, you know, what our um, other sure. panelists have already said. Yes, sir. Um, I think one of the questions had to do with you know, how to teach arts on from a literary uh, perspective. No? And uh, maybe it's a good time to highlight that the official syllabus no, specifically accounts for literature. No? The, and I quote, no, the course outline is broad enough to accommodate and understand the different art forms, literary arts, media arts, performative arts, and visual arts in both global and local contexts. And so, uh, and uh, so, so there, there is. Uh, I think uh, if if the literary perspective is not being accounted for yet, no, um, 
in how some of us are teaching arts one, then there is plenty of space no, precisely to, to do that. Um, I mentioned the architecture module earlier, and one of the texts that I actually include in that module is uh, There Will Come Soft Rains no, by Ray Bradbury. No? So it's a science fiction story that um, also allows us to explore you know, the, the, the smart homes or the idea of technology uh, and how it affects the way we live, no? uh, even in our most intimate uh, spaces. So uh, in fact, uh, as, as conceived or as written at least, the, the syllabus um, allows for us to, or allows different faculty uh, members with different specializations to come in and contribute something. No? And I mentioned this because uh, in our case, no, the Department of Studies at Diliman, no, um, this is something that we're struggling with because uh, as, as, of, as of now, we're the only academic unit no, um, handling arts one. And I think uh, it would be great no, if uh, it could be offered no, by, by other units, by other faculty members from different fields. No, um, just because the outline uh, or the, the syllabus is generous or capacious enough not to, to cover you know, these different uh, perspectives. So as, as of now, in fact, um, we have a he, 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 we're running up a rather huge backlog. No, in, <laughs> so this is the more practical side of it. A, yeah. We're running up a rather huge backlog uh, in terms of our classes. We're about 3,000 students behind. Um, and it would help no, if other academic units were to also participate. So that's it. Thank yeah, you. And, and that's, that's one of the opportunities, I think, uh, that, that we can further explore. Thank you, Sir Jay. Uh, so before we wrap things up, uh, Sir Jay wanted to add something more. You were raising your hand. Uh, yeah, about uh, literature. Uh, I have, in my entire syllabus, I'm into poetry, pero I think sa entire syllabus ko, dalawa lang ata poems na. At sina, the first poem was from Merle Alunan. It was contextualized with a phenomenon. Yung sa, may, may poem kasi siya about uh, Yolanda. And then the second poem that I included was my own poem, uh, read side by side the bulul, which was found as one of the artifacts inside a museum. So maganda siyang so yung literature na ginawa ko is to have it like have them in conversation with one another. Ayun. So parang same world but different forms of art, uh, different forms of expression through art. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Sir Shane. Uh, so, you know, medyo over time na po tayo, but I'm, I'm really happy that, you know, that the chat box is a buzz with comments and sharing from from our other participants, which is a great thing. Of course, one hour and a half, uh, it's not enough you know, for, for, you know, for, for a lengthy conversation for Arts One. And this is not the, the last, definitely. So we'll still have more chances to get together and to talk about those questions. We apologize if we will not be able to cover the other questions posed by our participants. But just to wrap uh, things up, maybe just very, very quickly, because uh, yung theme natin is baon bidahan no and we've already talked about yung mga baon ng ating mga participants nagbidahan na tayo dun sa ating mga strategies yung ating mga ginagawa sa ating respective CUs very quickly i'd like to uh, go, go uh, through each of the panelists what would be your probably final napaka parang beauty contest naman <laughs> to diba or final message farewell message for probably uh, before we end uh, the session uh, to your fellow arts one, or maybe not just arts one, but fellow GE or even fellow UP faculty who are currently in uh, in attendance. Just, you know, to wrap things up. Um, Sir Diego? Yes. Yeah, I, uh, I think what's clear, and this is what I was getting at the discussion uh, with Mr. Chatnat, and is that we've had to not deviate, but represent, as Robin you know, um, points out, um, the approved modules um, for the sake of creating um, authentic um, learning experiences um, and meaningful formative and summative assessment activities. Um, and I think, I think what I'm taking from this is that I actually have much more room to deviate, sorry, represent, um, than, than I thought. 
Um, but I think the models were still useful in terms of setting out and being general um, issues that we can't talk about um, and, uh, and what kinds of activities um, could be structured around that. So that yeah. Thank you, Sir Diego. Uh, Sir Mars? Actually, I can't really think of anything more to say. I think we've covered so much. Um, just final thoughts, maybe just a message of like, take care, everyone. <laughs> I mean, like uh, crisis, this crisis is, I mean, making everything uh, difficult for, for many of us. So I think we just have to be fair to not only to students, but to colleagues as well um, in how we handle situations. And uh, yeah, there's so much to learn from this situation and from each other. Yeah. Thank you, Sir Mars. And, you know, like I said, you can always continue this conversation even after this, this meeting. And our panelists, I would actually encourage you to type in your email address in the chat box so your, our participants can, you know, uh, email you directly or uh, contact you uh, whenever they want to do so. Uh, Sir Jay, any final thoughts or? Uh, well, I think uh, given our time of uncertainty, it's, it's, uh, I think we should probably place our, our faith no, uh, less in quote-unquote no best practice than in practice. No? Uh, the teaching is a craft that you have to keep doing over and over again, that you have to keep refining over and over again. Uh, and while it may never be perfect, whatever, that means no, um, it is important for us to commit no, to this to this craft in order for us to be able to support our students uh, to become uh, or to realize the fullness no, of uh, their potential. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sir Jay. Sir Shane? I am tempted to say I thank you. <laughs> uh, uh, a couple of things. One is that I still very much find useful yung, yung prepared um, modules ng, ng Arts One because it helps us focus ano yung ituturo, yung mga, ano yung tools na kailangan. And then second, um, I've helped, mag, oh, not I helped, maganda na ipakita sa mga students that art is literally, like literally everywhere. I tell them like the chair you're sitting on yung lines niyan, the way it's designed. You know, hindi siya, th that art is actually like, it's both utilitarian and beautiful and practical. Kahit yung book or minsan, for example, like this one, I would pick something like, look at this one. Bakit ganito yung design? Yung ball pen, yung, yung ganon. So, nakikita nila. So, ayun, make it more real. Make it something that is very, very relevant. Ayun. But exciting din, di ba? I thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much uh, for this very enriching conversation. Nako, sobrang bitin, no? Pero like I said, this is not the, definitely not the last. And I uh, would like to thank our panelists for, for their very insightful uh, answers and reflections. Of course, to all our participants who have been, you know, chatting in the, in the, you know, in the chat box, typing their questions or even their comments and sharing their their thoughts. Uh, this has been a great way of starting the, the GE conference. And uh, uh, from my end, as the, you know, as the outsider, as, as somebody who's not teaching arts one, and dami ko, rin, dami ko rin nalaman. But I think what stands out for me are basically two things. Uh, in terms of arts one, even if I'm, that's not my, you know, that's not my field, I'm not teaching it. What I realized from this conversation is that, you know, art is essential. And especially during this difficult time. Sabi nga ni Sir Diego kanina, it's probably one of the most relevant no, uh, GE courses. Of course, we can be uh, probably uh, said na parang that's our bias, which is true naman kasi arts want talaga yung conversation natin. But it is really, really uh, relevant, especially during these difficult times. And the other one was something to do with the role of our GE faculty na uh, sobrang importante ng role natin as GE faculty. Uh, how do we structure the course? How do we structure the learning experiences? to make our students appreciate, for example, Arts One or the, the, the GE program or the GE philosophy, even if, you know, like what Sir Shane said earlier, even if they're not inclined towards arts, no? at the end of the day, hopefully they see the value of Arts One 
um, not only in their degree program, but in their own uh, personal personal lives. Okay, and with that, again, maraming maraming salamat to Sir Mars, uh, Sir Diego, Sir Shane, Sir Jay uh, for uh, joining our conversation. Of course, thank you to our assistant moderator, uh, Ma'am Jessa, and uh, to the people sa GE Secretariat, those have been working very hard. Sa, yung mga ni-mention ni Ma'am Banji, sa technical working uh, technical working group, uh, thank you very much. And uh, to the GE Secretariat, sina Steph, uh, Danica, and uh, there's another one. I hope I'm not forgetting. And Rika, okay, maraming maraming salamat. So I think, Steph, uh, if you can uh, chat doon sa chat box, yung post sa chat box, how they can get the certificate. I think you need to uh, accomplish the evaluation form uh, if you want to get a certificate for this for your participation in this uh, in this session. But before we go, so it's there, yung feedback form natin, you can simply click that link. But before we go, uh, dapat may photo op daw tayo and I think we can be forgiven if nag over time tayo ng several minutes. 10.30 pa naman yung next. Ano. So if... Uh, uh, Sir Piers? Yes. Uh, we're also. I'm also supposed to give you. I mean, you, the panelists and moderators, your um, certificate of appreciation. Oh, but it's yes. okay. Uh, after, I suppose we can just show the certificate if Steph can do that uh, on the screen. And then after that, it's a photo op for, with all of yes. us. Uh, yeah. So Thank yeah. You. So it's Thank a certificate of appreciation from the Office of the Vice President for Academic Affairs. Uh, and we're presenting this to uh, Assistant Professor Pierce Dosena, our very able uh, moderator. Thank you so much. It, this is such a crucial first conversation in the series. So we were all of us kind of, yeah, but, uh, you know, it's been wonderful. Thank you. Uh, and then we have uh, also for our assistant moderator, Assistant Professor Jess Amarillie. Uh, and of course, to our very um, eloquent and uh, uh, very, uh, uh, yeah, eloquent and uh, thoughtful uh, panelists, Assistant Professor Mars Edwinson Jo T. Briones of UP Tacloban, um, uh, Assistant Prof Associate Professor Shane Carion of UP Cebu, and uh, Assistant uh, Associate Professor Diego Silang Maranan of UP Open University, and finally, uh, Professor uh, Jaime Oscar M. Salazar of uh, UP Diliman. Uh, and uh, also I wanted to just quickly say thank you to all of you who uh, joined the conversation. Uh, some, uh, you know, actually articulated their thoughts in the chat box, uh, but I'm sure uh, even those who didn't, uh, you know, uh, do so uh, were very much, you know, uh, with us in this conversation. We hope to see you in the next one, which is on Phil Arts One uh, at 10 o'clock in a few minutes. Uh, and then there's a third one at 1.30 or on Wika Isa. And of course, there's three more tomorrow as you, have, as you must have seen from the uh, invitation. So now maybe we can have a, a video. How, how does one call it? Uh, yeah, your photo, oh, group uh, picture. Yeah. Somebody yeah. needs to put, yeah. yeah. Thank we you, thank you. Dimpa. appear in the gallery or something. Yeah. So if you can please turn on your camera if you're able to do so. And then our secretariat will simply take a screenshot of that. Thank you, Dean Pat. Ten thirty, po pala yung uh, Phil Arts one, so we still hope to see you there in a little while. So please so, freeze your Steph, smiles. Can you, yeah, Steph, can you tell us when we will stop smiling or something or start <laughs> smiling or whatever? Okay, po. Um, for those of you who can op who can open your videos, please do so. Ayan. So one, two, three. One more. There are four slides here. Third. Okay. Smile lang po kayo kasi hindi natin alam kung saan po kayo lalabas. <laughs> Ayan. Okay. Done na? Thank yeah. you so much, everyone. See you Thank in you. the next Thank room. Thank you, everyone. See yeah, you in yeah. the next room. Bye-bye. Thank you and good morning. Keep safe, everyone.